Welcome our Secret History of Brazil tour. Wow. I'm Richard from Canada and this is... I'm Sari from Finland. So we have two gringos. <laughs> I'm about as white as you could be. Two gringos telling Brazilians about the history of their country. <laughs> That's kind of strange, isn't it? But it's a really beautiful privilege that we have to do this. And you know, I came here, Sadi, almost 20 years ago without any idea of what we're going to talk about today. And now I realize that I was kind of called to Brazil because of this dream we're going to talk about, because of this future for the world. I didn't even understand anything about that at the time. Was it the same for you? Sure, <laughs> sure. So what we are going to talk about this afternoon is about this book. The Fantastic Sig book. Fantastic book. Every Brazilian should read this book. Yeah, every Brazilian, yes. The Secret History of Brazil from Dr. Claudia Pacheco. And in this book, she speaks not only about the history of Brazil, about the future of Brazil, but about the history and future of humanity. As she's a psychoanalyst, her view of the history is psychological, spiritual, of great depth. And the main idea is that humanity has a dream of the return to goodness, beauty, and truth. Kind of return to paradise, the theologians would say, the science would say, the return to the origin maybe. And that this dream that is inside every human being has been the driving force of the historical events, including the discovery of Brazil. And when the Portuguese came here first, they had this idea in their minds that Brazil would have a very important role in this new era of humanity. There are lots of prophecies about this oh that you can find in this book. What I love about what Sadi is talking about now is this kind of the sense of an arc of a human story, that the human being has a story. You know, we, we, we were born into a paradise, we fell from that paradise, and now we're trying to, to get back. So when you think about the, the new age, or the third millennium, or the fifth empire. By the way, our, our school is millennium, right? The thousand years of happiness. Yeah, it's like it's not like just a, a mythology for children. It's like a real arc of the human story. Or when I say arc, I mean like from beginning to end. There's a storyline that goes through this whole book, and I hope we can bring some of that to you this afternoon because it's really fascinating to think that our life has a purpose that we have a need, we have a desire, and that we're going somewhere, right? We're not just floating around, wasting time. We're, we're go, trying to go somewhere. And with the work of Dr. Kepi and Dr. Claudia Pacheco, our work in Millennium, you see that there's an actual um, consciousness to this that's real, that's, that's tangible. It, it is something that leads us somewhere, okay? So we're not just living our lives to have fun, we're living our lives with a purpose. This is very beautiful in this work. And this is what we are going to experience this Hopefully. afternoon <laughs> yes. with some music, because this story has inspired many artists, musicians, philosophers over the time. So let's hear some music and then we'll tell you a little bit more. Wait a minute. I'm bilocating and I <laughs> and I changed my shirt in like 30 seconds. You have already changed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello, welcome to our Secret History of Brazil tour. We are the Teachers Band, all of us here. I hope you can see everybody. Yes, we have. We'll introduce the band a little later. And uh, we're going to start with a wonderful song that I think says a lot about the Secret History of Brazil. There's a lot of music in Brazil that relates to this theme. And here's one now, okay? All right, Mr. Fabricio. Na bruma le 
ville d'Aspachos qui vient de Dendro. Tu vien chegando pra brincar no meu quintal. No teu cavalo peito no cabelo ao vento. Eu estou tragando nossas roupas do varal. Na bruma leve d'Aspachos que vem de Dendro. Simulated yeah. Portuguese. Look, th this song talks about though this this idea of goodness coming from within, right? The songs of the cathedrals, a very spiritual experience. I think that's really beautiful. Uh, I dropped my pick here, Marcus Peter. Can you? So we are we are here in the patio of Millennium. Normally we do this tour uh, right in the in the center of São Paulo, Patio do Colégio. And I always like to remind the students that the first building that was built here, and the foundation of the city, was a school, right? Collegio. And so I think that's significant. It's like there's an educational um, uh, sort of energy in Sao Paulo. And uh, Dr. Kepi's work, our school millennium, our FATRI, Faculdade Trilogica, all of this is about education, about educating people about the values necessary for a new world and that's why we're here so this is the secret history of brazil we'll have another video explaining that in a minute but we want to do a song for you and um this is a an old reggae song called redemption song and this is about the slaves right the songs that they sang to remember what it was to be free and so this song's all about that and it's this hopeful song of looking forward going forward all the time. And this is what we always have to think about in these crazy times we live in, going forward, right? Can't stop in this crazy world. We have to go forward and do a better world. So this is a song about that, okay? Redemption song. All right. Ships. Minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit, my hand was made strong. 
strong By the hand of the Almighty We forward in this generation Triumphantly Once you held to sing ourselves can free our mind have no fear or atomic energy there's none of them can stop the time how long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look yes some say it's just a part of it we've got to fulfill the book once you help to see Okay, great, wonderful. We'll be back in a minute. But uh, we have another video now. Um, and I've been teaching the students all week to say Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> and having a lot of fun. I say to the students, if you can't say it correctly, you have to go in the corner and say it 50 times before you go home. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. And then I have to learn to say Nebuchadnezzar. Right? So this is the dream you'll see in a minute that has powered a lot of the movement of civilization. So. Let's watch that, and then we'll be, be back with another song. Okay? See you in a minute. You know, sometimes in the classroom, Sadi, I ask students, what, what are your dreams for the world? Like, what, what would you like the world to be? And they'll say justice and peace and goodness and equality and, you know, all of those beautiful words. And I always ask them, so where do you get that idea from? It doesn't come from your experience because we, we never experienced that on the planet. Where does it come from? It's something deep inside. So this has been, uh, so it's a kind, of, kind of a universal thing. And this has been eulogized and used in music. Uh, one of the songs we're going to do is called By the Rivers of Babylon. This was the story of the, the Jewish people who were slaves in Babylon and had this longing, this saudades, for a time that they had never known, but they knew was part of the human experience, this paradise. And they sang this song about being on the rivers of Babylon and dreaming about a better time and being able to face God in a way. So this has a big significance in the human spirit. We have this longing. That's the closest word in English to saudades this longing for a better time. So this is what we're, we're talking about now. And speaking about Babylon, maybe the most important, or one of the most important prophecies in humanity is the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. How, is that the yeah, way perfect, you say it? Perfect, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. In Portuguese, Nabucodonosor. 
He was a king of Babylon, and at the time, the Jewish people were slaves in Babylon. And there was one prophet called Daniel, and he got the task to guess and interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And we have a little video about what happened. Let's see. Can you tell me my dream and what it means? Your Majesty, not even the smartest person in all the world can do what you are demanding. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And while you were sleeping, he showed you what will happen in the future. Your Majesty, what you saw standing in front of you was a huge and terrifying statue. This image, huge and dazzling, towered before you, fearful to behold. Its head was made of gold. Its chest and arms were silver. And from its waist down to its knees, it was bronze. From there to its ankles, it was iron. And its feet were a mixture of iron and clay. As you watched, a stone was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. The stone struck the feet, completely shattering the iron and clay, and swept away like chaff before the wind until no trace remained. But the stone became a tremendous mountain that covered the entire earth. And the meaning of the dream? Why does it fill me with dread? Because you, O oh King of Kings, you are that head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom. And then a third. And then a fourth, as strong as iron. During the time of those kings, the God who rules from heaven will set up an eternal kingdom that will never fall. Now I know that your God is above all other gods and kings because he gave you the power to explain this mystery. I will make you chief of all my wise men and governor of the province of Babylon. Nice story. Nice story. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, about the statue that has four parts and the fifth part, the stone, that kind of takes away this old type of civilization, will start and cover all the earth. So the prophecy means that the old type of civilization is going to lose its place and a new one will come. There are different interpretations of these four empires. One we know, Daniel just said, the head is Babylon. In Dr. Claudia's book, she considers the second Medo-Persian, the third, the Greek Roman civilization that was the era of the bronze, and this time, the fourth empire of iron and clay that is the most destructive one. And our current period, right? The time we're in now. Yes. Falling apart. Falling apart with. And we uh, can feel that in the world, can't we? It's falling apart that we, something new needs to take its place. Because as its basis are inverted, it would never last. Yeah. And this fifth empire, the empire of happiness, some people say it will come from Brazil, <laughs> which is very difficult for my students to believe, but many prophets, many scientists, artists visualize the story like this. So we will continue studying this book and you will discover more. See you soon. Well, yeah, we have a number of Fourth Empire people here, I think, right? I'm from the Fourth Empire. You're from the Third Empire. I'm from, from the Third. Jaeda. From no? Rome, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> my empire, 
Uh, so this is Fabrizio. Joseph from Sweden, Fourth Empire, I guess, right? Fourth or fifth. Yeah, maybe. You're, you feel, you're from the Fourth Empire, but you feel part of the Fifth. Marco Lira from Finland, I think. Fifth Empire. Fifth Empire all the way. And our, really, our only really born in the Fifth Empire guy is Marcus Peta. A thousand years of happiness, Marcus Peta. That's, your, <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure on you, man. <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to sing this uh, Rivers of Babylon now. Uh, this is a song, you know, the, the, the Jews were slaves for many, many, many years. And this is a slave song. This is what the slaves sang when they wanted to remember their heritage. They sang about this. So this is a song about that by the Rivers of Babylon. Okay? Mm -hmm. One, two, one, two, Required from us a song How can we sing the Lord's song In a strange land When the wicked carried us away Captivity required from us a song How can we sing the Lord's song In a strange land It's a kind of a meditative song, isn't it? And they, when, they, when they, they, they wrote these slave songs, they wrote a lot of them in a very simple way so they could be rem remembered and passed on for generations. So now we're passing it on to you. Okay, so let's go back to our secret history of Brazil. And now we have a, an introduction to the Phoenicians. Many people don't understand this story in Brazil, thinking that Cabral arrived here by accident. But the truth is much deeper than that. So, then we'll be back in a few minutes. Hello, this is teacher Sari from Finland. With and this is me, Fabrizio, from Italy. Teacher Fabrizio. Hi, Sari. Hi. And let's continue speaking about the highlights of the secret history of Brazil. 
And this time, we would like to explain to you that it was not exactly the way people learn at school that Cabral came to Brazil by mistake. There was knowledge of Brazil long, long before. And in fact, we could say that it's not that Brazil exists because of Portugal, but Portugal exists because of Brazil. How come? Because a long time ago, the Temple Knights went to Temple of Solomon, what was left of it, and found maps about Brazil. And these maps came from the Phoenicians, the great navigators, long before Christ used to come to Brazil. That was about the time of the great King Solomon. And they had agreements with Solomon to bring him plants and minerals and animals from the distant places they would go. So from their travels to Brazil and other corners of the world, they would bring knowledge and material things to Jerusalem. Later on, their maritime information and maps were kept in the Library of Solomon. And around 1300, yeah. the 1300, 1200, the Temple Knights. The Temple Knights, yeah. When they go to Jerusalem, they discover this information about the distant lands yeah. in Brazil. And they start planning the discovery of Brazil. And what do they do first? Well, what is important of the Temple Knights is that, for example, uh, they, they preserved all these maps and all this knowledge that we have in the, let's say, in the Iberian uh, Peninsula, let's say. And uh, this was so important because they prepared in the centuries yeah, the come uh, to, um, to Brazil. Yeah, especially, I don't know if, we, if I can say through uh, Don Diniz later on, yeah? Because these maps were preserved, preserved there. They founded a very important school that was called the uh, Scola di Sagres, and uh, where all the great uh, sailors, etc., they studied and uh, they knew exactly where they have, they have to go. And that was in Portugal, yes. because they created the state of Portugal, yes. which is actually the first modern uh, state in Europe. Yes. And it's in the uttermost corner, in a very distant place of Europe. Yeah. What for? Because it's the closest place to Brazil. To Brazil. Yeah. An excellent place to prepare the navigations that would take them to what they believed to be the... New land, the, new land, the, uh, the kingdom uh, of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, paradise lost, according to many, many writers, Milton, John Milton, it's a utopia, Thomas More, yeah, they was the, probably Brazil, yeah, this land, so it was very important. Also, literature brings us a lot of knowledge about that. So, Portugal carried these ideals of the Fifth Empire to all corners of the world. to Brazil and discovered a wonderful world. Yes. <laughs> what a what a segue. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, you're bilocating in Yeah, I'm bilocating too and I, I changed I, your I shirt. Changed my shirt too. It's a it's a, a teacher oh, man. <laughs> it's a magic. Yeah. Yeah. We discovered the uh, the new world the fifth empire, yeah. the, the empire of magic. <laughs> it's incredible because it's vibration yeah. inner resonance. Yeah. Okay. What a wonderful world. You can sing along. Please. I see trees green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I 
glossy skies of blue and clouds of white. The bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself. Are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, How do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry, I watch them grow. What a wonderful world. Yeah. Yes. It is a beautiful world. Beautiful I, world. I ask my students many times what are the great things about Brazil, the climate, the nature, the people? A secret history of Brazil. Okay, so now we have a, another video for you to watch to tell more of the story. The, um, a couple of videos, actually. We're going to hear a little bit about San Bernardo and Joaquina de Fiori. So these are two uh, theologians yeah. who are very instrumental in uh, this uh, kingdom of God on earth. Let's put it that way, as, as plainly as we can. And uh, Fabricio is going to talk about Giacomo de Fiori. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to biallocate afterwards. Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> and talk a little bit about Giacomo de Fiori. But this time you will have a surprise. Ah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Let's <laughs> and uh, Frederick talking about San Bernardo. So uh, we'll be back in a minute. This is a really uh, interesting part of the story now because it, it makes Brazil, links Brazil with this theological arc I was talking about in the introduction, the story of human beings. So... Here we go. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Frédéric Esteve et je suis professeur à l'école de langue Millennium, qui est le centre de langue de la faculté trilogique Kep et Pacheco. Dans le cadre de cette English Tour, nous allons aujourd'hui voir un grand personnage français. Saint Bernard de Clairvaux. Qui était-il et quelle est sa connexion avec les fameux Templiers, les Templiers européens qui jusqu'à aujourd'hui sont connus et euh, admirés dans toute l'Europe et dans d'autres régions. Saint Bernard, c'est un moine du 11e siècle, 11e et 12e siècle, et il est né dans la région de Bourgogne. À ce titre, il devient abbé de Clairvaux, qui est la localité où était située l'abbaye de Clairvaux, et il fonde l'ordre des cisterciens, hein, l'ordre des cisterciens avec toutes les abbayes cisterciennes telles qu'on peut encore les visiter aujourd'hui. Qu'est-ce qu'il a fait Il est rédacteur de la règle de l'ordre du temple et fondateur du Portugal, on va y revenir. Alors, qu'est-ce que c'est que cette règle de l'ordre du Temple Eh bien, pour l'ordre des chevaliers de l'ordre du Temple, autrement connu comme Templier, il définit la règle latine qui synthétise les idéaux de l'ordre. C'est-à-dire, à, à l'époque, la chevalerie, l'idéal du chevalier du Moyen-Âge et la vie monastique, l'idéal du moine qui vit contemplation dans son monastère. Quels sont ces idéaux des Templiers définis à travers la règle latine et édictée par Saint Bernard La spiritualité, l'universalisme chrétien, 
la justice sociale et économique, la paix, la connaissance universelle. Vous voyez que ces idéaux sont des universaux qui ont traversé, des concepts universels qui ont traversé toute l'histoire de l'humanité et qui prédominent jusqu'à aujourd'hui. À ce titre, Saint Bernard fait une synthèse de l'esprit caractéristique du nord de la France à cette époque, mystique, ascétique, et de l'esprit qui vigorait dans le sud de la France, l'esprit chevaleresque de courtoisie, le courtois, le beau, l'élégance. Si on peut résumer en une phrase cette règle latine et les préceptes édictés par Saint Bernard, on pourrait dire que cela consiste pour les Templiers et pour les adeptes de cette règle latine à dominer la chair et à fortifier l'esprit. Alors, dans son livre « Le règne de l'homme » ou « règne du homme » en portugais, Norbert Kepp fait une analyse des écrits de Saint Bernard avec trois degrés de la connaissance. Le premier degré, selon Saint Bernard, serait l'humilité qui est sœur de la vertu. Cette humilité qui permet d'agir bien, d'agir de façon vertueuse. Le deuxième niveau, tel que décrit par Saint Bernard, serait cette compassion pour le prochain qui vient directement des, des, des messages du Christ. Cette compassion pour le prochain, cet élan à, faser, à faire le bien pour l'autre, pour notre prochain. Et enfin, le troisième degré de l'élévation, de la connaissance selon Saint Bernard, et analysé par Kep, c'est la contemplation de Dieu. À ce titre, Kep dit que Saint Bernard a une influence immense jusqu'à aujourd'hui sur toute la spiritualité occidentale. Et à nouveau, si on veut résumer Saint Bernard à deux euh, préceptes hein, ou à deux, deux, deux règles, ce serait la subordination de la raison humaine, de la raison à la foi, la foi est primordiale, et la primauté de l'amour. À ce titre, il voue un culte immense qui sera perpétué par ses successeurs à la Vierge Marie. Il est dévot de la Sainte Vierge de Notre-Dame. Pour terminer, il prépare quand l'ordre du Temple commence à être persécuté par le propre roi de France et par le Vatican, il prépare le futur ordre qui sera les chevaliers du Christ au Portugal et il prépare la fondation du Portugal avec sa création en 1143 où serait prolongé ce royaume chrétien universel et le culte à la troisième personne de la Trinité, qui serait le Saint-Esprit. Voilà. Un bref résumé de ce qu'a été et ce qu'est encore aujourd'hui Saint Bernard à travers ses écrits. Saint Bernard de Clairvaux, un grand personnage, mentor des Templiers, créateur du Portugal et, dans la lignée du Portugal, une grande influence au Brésil également. Voilà, merci à tous, à bientôt pour d'autres aventures avec d'autres personnages célèbres de France. Merci. Salve, sono Fabrizio Bigliotti, eh, professore della Scuola di Lingue Millennium, il centro eh, di lingue della Facoltà Trilogica che è Pipaceco. Oggi siamo qui per parlare di Gioacchino da Fiore, uno dei più grandi teologi eh, italiani del Medioevo, che Claudia Paceco cita nel libro Storia Segreta del Brasile eh, per la sua visione speciale, molto speciale, della Trinità. Infatti per Gioacchino da Fiore la visione della Trinità il padre del figlio dello Spirito Santo, non era solamente una visione eh, relativa a dispensazioni, diciamo, delle tre figure di Dio padre, Dio figlio e dello Spirito Santo, ma che ogni dispensazione corrisponderebbe ad una fase storica dell'umanità. Quindi eh, l'era del Dio padre eh, legata a Mosè, Abra Abramo e gli altri profeti, il figlio eh, sarebbe l'era di Cristo, e poi lo Spirito Santo, una futura eh, era, un'era futura di pace, di armonia, di giustizia, chiamata anche 
eh, la parusia, chiamata anche il millennio, mille anni di felicità eh, in cui l'essere umano, la civiltà umana, sarebbe eh, poco a poco ritornata alla, eh, diciamo così, a casa, a Dio. I quinto imperialisti come Fernando Pessoa, Padre Viera e altri credono nella previsione dell'abate italiano Gioacchino da Fiore. Qui noi possiamo vedere un disegno originale di Gioacchino da Fiore che per rappresentare la Trinità usò lo strumento anche biblico usato dal re Davide che era il salterio a dieci corde, come vediamo qui. E in questa figura successiva possiamo vedere meglio come la figura triangolare dello strumento musicale ci mostri le tre figure di Dio Padre, di Dio Figlio e lo Spirito Santo. È interessante perché eh, Claudia Pacheco nel suo libro Storia Segreta del Brasile dice così come si ebbe una dispensazione di Dio Padre per il genere umano, per mezzo di Mosè e dei profeti, un'altra del Figlio, per mezzo di Cristo e degli Apostoli, ci sarà una dispensazione dello Spirito Santo che si spargerà su tutti i popoli e le persone, inaugurando il Quinto Impero, in mille anni di felicità prima del giudizio finale. Questa visione di Gioacchino influenzò tutte le successive generazioni di eh, religiosi, come teologi, come San Francesco, eh, Sant'Antonio da Padova, fra molti altri. E Norberto Keppe nel libro eh, Il eh, Regno dell'Uomo, o Regno do Omen, scrive «Nella trilogia analitica siamo giunti alla coscienza dell'unificazione che esiste, non solo tra la filosofia e la teologia, ma anche riguardo alla scienza, sebbene siano distinte fra di loro, Esattamente come succede fra Dio e nell'uomo. Padre, figlio e spirito. Sentimento, pensiero e azione. Senza ovviamente eh, conoscere Gioacchino da Fiore, eh, Norberto Keppe studia e basa tutto il suo lavoro scientifico proprio sullo studio eh, trinitario. E in questo senso mostra come anche le persone che si trovino diciamo, in questa sintonia eh, di elementi universali, non importa in quale periodo storico si trovino, riescono a aggiungere praticamente alla stessa, non dico alle stesse conclusioni, ma perlomeno a, eh, diciamo, a ritrovare gli elementi comuni. Infatti Norberto Keppe dice sempre nel libro O Reino do Omen, Il Regno dell'Uomo, le tre persone che formano un unico Dio sono distinte l'una dall'altra. E nell'uomo queste tre istanze costituiscono lo stesso essere. Diciamo che sono differenti nel modo in cui si applicano, contenendo tuttavia la stessa sostanza, nucleo, che si ramifica in tre direzioni. Quindi come Gioacchino da Fiore diceva, queste tre figure sono unite da un'unica sostanza, come noi possiamo vedere nuovamente nello strumento del salterio, dove al centro c'è un cerchio dove c'è scritto Yehweh, che sarebbe Yahweh, Dio, così Norberto Keppe giunse, diciamo attraverso la scienza, nella stessa conclusione. E Claudia Pacheco, per terminare, nel suo libro Storia segreta del Brasile riassume in questi tre triangoli l'applicazione, la diciamo, eh, anche universale trinitaria eh, della trilogia analitica, della scienza della trilogia analitica, che sorge proprio a partire da questa concezione, da questa, di questo intendimento della Trinità. Per esempio, noi possiamo vedere nel triangolo, questa figura, nel triangolo superiore, eh, l'applicazione alla, alla parte, diciamo così, della spiritualità, le parti fondamentali o chiaramente della, della vita eh, umana. Abbiamo il Dio Padre con l'ebraismo, il Dio Figlio con il cristianesimo e il Dio Spirito, l'universalità. Però questo, diciamo, questa visione trinitaria si applica anche alla sfera diciamo, individuale, che è quella dell'essere umano, come vediamo in basso a sinistra del sentimento, l'amore, del pensiero, la ragione e l'azione pura, l'atto puro che è la coscienza. Okay? E per finire, eh, questa visione trinitaria si applica anche alla società, ai tre, alle tre aree diciamo, della conoscenza umana fondamentali che sono la teologia, eh, che è diciamo, la radice diciamo, dell'origine dell di, tutte, di tutte le cose, quindi l'intendimento dell'origine di tutte le cose, la filosofia e per finire la scienza, che è eh, un elemento fondamentale che oggi ci porta a questa comprensione. 
Ecco, questi diciamo, un po' sono gli elementi che eh, accomunano la visione diciamo, trinitaria di Gioacchino da Fiore e quella di Norberto Keppe, considerando però che Norberto Keppe, ovviamente, quando ha sviluppato il suo lavoro scientifico, non conosceva ovviamente eh, il lavoro di Gioacchino da Fiore. Our beloved French and Italian. Actually, you're a Come here and come here, Sari. We have a come microphone. Come, Sari. Yeah, we have a microphone. Sari has joined we us from Finland. We have our teacher, Sari, from Finland. Take, take the microphone right there, Sari. Yeah. Okay. So come in. Come in here on camera. Hello, okay. hello, <laughs> students. I'm very happy to be here today with every one of you. And I just was he reading here Alessandra's uh, testimonial. She's saying, "I love this way to explain these things in different languages." As a polycot myself and forever. Mm. Uh, one minute, I'm not very good with technologies. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, cell phones. Mm -hmm. Man. As a polycot myself and forever student of languages, this is a kind of therapy for me. Thanks to all those, I think she said, that make this come true. Made this so, possible, yes. yes, thank you, Teachers Band, thank you, Teachers from Millennium, and thank you, all the students participating in this event today. Yeah, we love you guys. <laughs> yeah. Great that you're here with us. We love to do this uh, at the Patio de Colegio, and maybe, maybe if we're lucky, in a few months or next year, we can go down there again. But for now, here we are. Yeah, we're missing the chocolate cake oh, from man. Patio de Colegio. Yes, aren't we? the German cake and the the experience of being with other people. So we have to try and do this virtually, you know, it's a challenge. But, but we, it seems they are enjoying yeah, it greatly, so, so. Yeah, we love having you here. <laughs> we can feel you, your <laughs> vibrations. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we're going to do another song. What's uh, the song? This is a song called Hallelujah. This is kind mm. of a prayer. Uh, it's very fitting after this theological part that Frederick and, and Fabrizio took us so beautifully through the theological history. It's beautiful, you know, guys, because we, we, don't, we don't realize that this is the history of huma humanity. Yeah, Richard, uh, I, as an Italian, I tell you, I, ne I had never studied before yeah. this. Yeah. So it's very interesting, this book of Dr. Claudia Pacheco, The Secret History of Brazil, because it's a, a collection of important documents, historical documents. Yeah. So I really recommend to read this book to everybody, to all our students, of course, your families. It's very interesting. I was just editing a, a, an interview I did with Cesar Sauce a number of years ago. I was editing it for another purpose. And he was talking about how this cut away from theology and philosophy, how science just cut theology and philosophy out, has made us very materialistic. And so this uh, experience of the secret history of Brazil and what Fabrizio and Sadi and Frederick and everybody's been talking about is reconnecting us to the theological story of human humanity, that we are connected to God, not to material. Well, we're connected to material too, of course, but that we have this connection, which is very, very important, and cutting that out of science has made us very poor. So we're trying to rescue that. Dr. Kepi's work is very much about rescuing what we left behind in the past. So and, this is so Richard. Doing. What is called utopia is actually something possible. Yeah, yeah. It's if here now, right? Here now, yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll we'll sing a prayer for you. I've heard there was a secret code that David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this The fourth, the fifth The minor fall and the major lift The baffled king composing Hallelujah 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 Through, yeah. She 
tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throat and she cut your head. And from your lips she drew the hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now maybe there's a God above on all I've ever learned from love. How to shoot at someone who are true, yeah. It's not a cry that you hear at night. It's not somebody who's seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. 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 vibration huh okay so we're back in a few minutes but uh, we have a very interesting uh, introduction to Don Luis and Isabel the two uh, leaders in Portugal that really kept this or started kept this dream of the fifth empire alive and moving to Brazil so that video and then we'll be back in a few minutes Portugal foi um reino que levou nos seus navios o cristianismo templário, a fé portuguesa no Espírito Santo e em Nossa Senhora, para todos os rincões da terra. Os reis portugueses eram da ordem dos cavaleiros do Templo de Salomão, fundada por São Bernardo de Claraval. Eram os guardiões dos tesouros do templo que agora estavam em tomar Portugal. Sonhavam em chegar a essa terra abençoada, aonde iam os fenícios e os judeus na antiguidade. Eram todos reis templários, como o rei Dom Diniz e a rainha Santa Isabel, 
que agora conversam no ano de 1296. E que pensas, meu amado rei Diniz, olhando assim pensativo para o mar? Querida Isabel, penso em coisas mais altas neste momento, que lá ao longe, neste mar distante, escondida na linha do horizonte, está a terra abençoada, onde nascerá o quinto império, o paraíso terrestre, a ilha da Vera Cruz, a terra de Santa Cruz. Sim, lá está a ilha distante onde todos os nossos sonhos serão concretizados. E também o que falou o nosso santo Abade, Dom de Joaquino de Fiore, que viu no relance a história da humanidade. Penso nas três idades que ele anunciou. A primeira de Deus Pai foi a de Moisés e os profetas. A segunda idade é a de Deus Filho, a Era de Cristo que estamos vivendo agora. Mas disse o Santo Abade, virá ainda uma terceira manifestação divina, uma terceira idade, a do Espírito Santo, que trará a plenitude ao homem, à mulher, e santificará a humanidade. Isso nos enche de amor e de esperança. Só depois da dispensação do Espírito Santo, a humanidade voltará ao paraíso perdido. E o reino do Espírito Santo será nesta terra distante, como nós sabemos, que já chamo de Ilha Brasil, que quer dizer terra abençoada. Estamos encarregados dessa missão. Não te lembras como nosso Senhor Jesus Cristo apareceu ao fundador do nosso reino, Dom Afonso Henriques? Jesus lhe disse que se usasse na bandeira, portuguesa, o sinal de suas chagas, tudo venceria e Cristo iria fazer da nossa nação o povo que levaria o cristianismo a todos os rincões do mundo. E a mensagem do quinto império e da era do Espírito Santo. Para cumprir essa missão, precisamos navegar por este imenso mar. Precisamos chegar lá, na terra de Santa Cruz aonde iam os fenícios e os marinheiros de Salomão, para lá iniciarmos o reino divino, para fazer de toda a terra o templo, o templo do Espírito Santo. E como pretendes fazer isso, meu rei? Ah, eu já mandei plantar pinheiros em Leiria para fazer os navios, chamei genoveses para organizar nossa armada e reabri a ordem do templo. Agora, a nossa ordem templária chamará a Ordem de Cristo. Navegar é preciso, minha rainha, e chegou a hora disto. Sabe, meu amado rei Diniz, tive um sonho esta noite. E o que sonhaste? Sonhei que deveríamos fazer uma festa para a terceira pessoa da trindade. Foste inspirada, Isabel. Uma festa com participação dos povos e dos pobres sem classes, que expresse como será o reino do Espírito Santo? Que tal ter o um menino coroado imperador? Não disse o nosso amado Abade de Fiore que o templo será o templo das crianças, o quinto império? É muito boa ideia! No meu sonho havia uma bandeira que seria levada no cumprido mastro e que no centro teria a pomba do Espírito Santo. A bandeira seria levada de mão em mão através dos tempos e manterá vivo o sonho do Quinto Império. E foi assim que nasceu em Tomar, Portugal, 700 anos atrás, a Festa do Divino, que se espalhou por muitos lugares e hoje se comemora em muitas partes do mundo, especialmente no Brasil. Uma festa que existe há séculos. Essas festas tiveram início na Idade Média com a Rainha Santa Isabel e com o Rei Dom Diniz, Reis Templários Portugueses. Eles já visualizaram que um dia cristianismo puro poderia então existir na Terra. É um ideal 
especialmente da alma portuguesa, que se viva um mundo onde todos têm os mesmos direitos, independente de raça, de cor, e isso é uma marca dos povos de língua portuguesa. Now this is one that you have to sing along to because everybody knows this song. This is uh, famous. This is A Bandeira do Divino. Yeah, huh? y Ivan Lins. Great. So we're expecting to hear you. Yeah. Okay. One, two, one, two. Os devotos do divino ao abrir sua morada na bandeira do menino serve minha Todo mundo cantou? Ooh, Everybody? Uh, very nice. I, I, I could hear your voice. <laughs> you could feel you. I could feel <laughs> the vibration. Feel. <laughs> Through the air. Good. Okay, so now um, uh, the, the uh, Jesuits. Uh, there's a lot of things said negatively about the Jesuits, about the Cavaleros Templarios, you know, and always there's this sort of campaign in the world to take away the real story. And so we're going to give you the true story of the Jesuits now. Hello, it is Sari and Fabricio again. And now we would like to tell you a little bit about the foundation of city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo was founded by the Jesuits and it was founded as a school because for this new time, new era, they believed that education would be fundamental. And it's very uncommon for a city to start as a school. So that is the important role of São Paulo. The Jesuits carried these ideals that was uh, very strong in Portugal and in the Temple Knights that were, whose existence was prohibited and they changed their name to the Order of Christ. Cabral was part of the Order of the Christ. Later on, the Order of Christ 
was prohibited. And finally, these ideals ended up among the Jesuits. So they were carrying all these ideas of Giochino di Fiori, the Temple Knights, about the future society. And they believed this society would start from Brazil and that what they were working here. They were working with the Indians, bringing them these ideals of the Fifth Empire. They were teaching them uh, Christianity. They were teaching them art, how to cultivate the lands, and how to live in peace together. And they tried also to uh, create like a society based on justice, uh, equality, yeah? So many people that criticize the missions, etc. But we know, and there is a beautiful movie about that, The Mission, yeah, a very old movie, that shows us exactly what the Jesuits tried to do, to create here like this paradise, this, uh, this realm, this kingdom of happiness. And one curiosity is that in the missions, the Indians, they, um, they learn how, for example, to build instruments, musical instruments. You know, sorry, that in Brazil, the tradition of uh, production of uh, violins and especially violoncellos uh, was taught by the Jesuits. So these incredible skills that they got, they got from the Jesuits. So it's very nice, yeah? And because this third era, the era of the Holy Spirit, is characterized by beauty. Yeah. Arts. arts. And also they had a very interesting economic system that you can see in this movie Mission. Mm -hmm. I warmly recommend you watch if you want to know more. Where they worked together, had more justice, no slavery. Of course, what happens in this kind of situation, the people in power didn't like this idea. And the missions were crushed by mm -hmm. the people in power which is a sad story, but understanding the human pathology, this is what we can see in the history of humanity. But certainly, this ideal still continue here in Sao Paulo and can be revived. Yeah. And it is interesting, Sari, uh, because uh, this is based on education, so the importance of education, of schools, etc., and not of economy, economics. Eh? So this is something that brings us to, uh, uh, to think over it. Why, what would happen if people uh, could, be, could have more knowledge, more consciousness, because... Art. Arts, yeah. How could society be? So, let's listen to some more music now. Another song that's a kind of a prayer. Marco. Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. And when the broken-hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer, let it be. For though they may be parted, there is still a chance that they will see. There will be an answer. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. There will be an answer, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. 
let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. getting close to the end. Now we have a final video and a very beautiful one. It's our reading at the end of the, uh, of the, of the uh, tour. We always read a segment from the book. And this is Sadi and Leo, right? Reading? Just Sadi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Hello, this is Teacher Sadi, and I would like to make a little conclusion here and make you to think. The ideals represented in this book, The Secret History of Brazil, about a better society, a society of justice, they have been part of most revolutions, most great events, like the Constitution of the United States and other situations. However, if humanity has this dream and desire, why don't we have this paradise on Earth? In this point, Dr. Kepp's work on psychosociopathology and his science of analytical trilogy is finally giving us some tools to work towards this real human social reality. Because what happened in all those past events, that all those beautiful ideals, many times the execution was a disaster. Think about the French Revolution with beautiful ideas, but such a disaster, or even the socialist communist ideals, but the practice was a disaster because people didn't want to deal with any problems. They wanted to exterminate the consciousness of any problems. And that's why now all those who want to work for more justice, more goodness, more beauty in our society, it's very, very important that you study and understand psychopathology and sociopathology 
And this is what we can do at Milenio, in Faculdade Trilogica, que é Pepe Pacheco, to start understanding the human being and the society. I want to read here a part from this book that I find it's very, very beautiful. Em seu livro, A Clorificação, Kepe escreve um texto muito elucidativo sobre a necessidade de haver interiorização para sanarmos, inclusive, os problemas exteriores, sociais. Eu tenho repetido muitas vezes que, em minha opinião, a humanidade a que pertencemos não entrou ainda em uma fase realmente psicológica. Isto é, não aceitou voltar-se para o seu principal fundamento, a vida psíquica. Não apenas no campo político, mas tudo o que acontece é interpretado sob o ponto de vista social, tentando-se ver a causa de todas as dificuldades em fatores alheios à vida psíquica. Deste modo, toda a história da humanidade sofre uma interpretação superficial e, para não dizer, frequentemente inversa ao seu real significado. O Criador fez um universo tão majestoso justamente para nos mostrar uma parte de toda a sua magnificência, convidando-nos amorosamente para que partilhemos de tal maravilha. E se tal grandeza um dia cairá e só nós, seres humanos, permaneceremos em outro universo a ser criado, provavelmente mais resplandecente ainda. É porque cada um de nós pode ter, em seu interior, um mundo mais belo ainda. Só o fato de se possuir consciência indica nossa a existência do infinito entre nós e todo o cosmos. A beleza, a verdade e a bondade que carregamos em nosso interior superam de longe tudo que de belo, verdadeiro e bom existe no exterior. Não é possível estabelecer uma comparação. De tal maneira, o homem supera todo o restante criado. E, no entanto, queremos impedir o trabalho de Deus, pois o que caracteriza a neurose e psicose é a atitude de oposição, negação ou deturpação ao que ele fez, principalmente ao nosso interior. O processo de alienação é simplesmente o de inveja, que é uma atitude de negar, omitir ou deturpar o que somos. Vale a pena conservar a inveja? Deus, sendo o amor, a verdade e a beleza, fez-nos a sua imagem e semelhança, que importa em uma grande felicidade. É só aceitá-la. One more time. As paixões que vêm de dentro Tu vem chegando pra brincar no meu tal Com teu cavalo feito no cabelo ao vento Eu só parando nossas roupas no varal Na bruma leve das paixões que vêm de dentro Tu vem chegando pra brincar no meu tal
Deus já escuta os teus sinais A voz do anjo sussurrou no meu ouvido Eu não duvido, já escuto os teus sinais Que tu velias numa manhã de domingo Eu te anuncio nos sinais das catedrais Paixões que vêm de dentro Tu vem chegando pra brincar no meu final No teu cavalo feito no cabelo ao vento Eu só parando nossas roupas no varal Tu vens, tu vens Eu já escuto os teus sinais Tu vens, tu vens Okay, well, that's our time for today. Fabrizio Bileotti de Italia, Joseph Gardmo de Suécia, Marco Lira de Finlandia, Marcus Pera de Zona Leste, né? Yeah. And Richard Jones Richard from Canada. Canada. Paulinho, do we have a camera? Can you see Paulinho? No? Turn the camera. Paulinho, turn the camera. Our camera. technician Paulinho and JP. Sari <laughs> is helping. Sorry. Sari, fantastic. Where's JP? <laughs> JP. JP. JP, Come man. On. João Pedro. João Pedro. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in the classroom. We'll see yeah. you around. And God bless everybody. All bye the best. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.